Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Um, I'm Susan Couch. I'm the chairperson of the SMT committee, and I want to welcome you all to our class on the Apple Corporation, the rise, fall, and rise again of Apple Inc. I think it's going to be a fascinating discussion. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Grant Austin. He's originally from Wisconsin, but he attended Calvin College or University now and uh, fell in love with Western Michigan. Who doesn't love Western Michigan? It's so beautiful here. He spent several years working at Apple as a certified technician uh, prior to starting his own in-home tech service business. Uh, it's called RGA Tech Support. He started that in 2017. As he tells his mother when she calls in technological distress, technology is my passion, assisting others is my vocation. So he's <laughs> really excited to be here to chat with all of you. And I'll turn it over to Grant. Thank you. Hello, thank you guys for coming out today. Um, today we're talking about truly one of my favorite topics. And I, I don't say that lightly. Um, anytime I'm with my wife and there's new Apple news, she is the first to know despite it not being her favorite topic to talk about. But today we're gonna to talk about Apple uh, from beginning to end. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of a wild ride. And I'm also gonna throw in a disclaimer there that I have only been alive for some of this. And so those of you that have seen it and watched it, feel free to throw up a hand if you have something to add. I would love your perspective as well. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's such a fun topic and it's definitely, it has not always been an upward trajectory. Um, the company, it grew fast. Um, it struggled a bit and it's regained some footing. And so if, uh, it, it, yes, it has regained some footing, it's doing okay. Um, <laughs> um, I want to say this as well in preparation for this class, I read through Steve, Steve Jobs biography. Um, and so Apple, Apple Inc, formerly Apple Computer Co has grown into one of the world's largest and most profitable companies. Um, the company was birth, birthed by a visionary and a genius, uh, and it was forged by an obsession for perfection. Steve Jobs has been referred to as many things. Um, I'm sure all of you have read some of the stories, um, but the, he is truly the heart and soul of the Apple. At least he was the heart and soul of the Apple company in, in the first couple of decades. Um, there's, there's no Apple without Steve Jobs. And so as we travel throughout this timeline, um, we are also going to be stepping through Steve Jobs' personal timeline as well and how that foundation helped form the company we know today. All right, so you already all know me. Um, thank you for not throwing anything for this one. Um, so we're going to start out by talking about Steve Jobs' parents. Um, now, he has his adoptive parents who we're looking at right here, um, Paul and Clara. Um, Let's see, Paul Jobs joined the Coast Guard at age 19 um, and was an engineer. Um, this man was very good um, with, with mechanics. Um, he, and you will see that throughout the course of his life, um, he had a very good understanding of how things should work. Um, let's see, when he actually got back uh, and stepped off the boat, he made a bet that he would, he would marry his wife within two weeks. And he did. Um, enter Clara. Um, Clara was born in New Jersey, uh, initially, eventually moved to San Francisco. Her parents um, were from Armenia. Uh, let's see, Clara opted to hang out. So this is how they actually met was they, she was supposed to hang out with another group of people and that group of people didn't have access to a car. So she ended up hanging out with um, Paul Jobs, and uh, 10 days later, they were engaged. Yeah. So Steve's biological parents. So um, his biological mom, Joanne, um, and forgive me for this, I'm probably going to refer to him as John often, um, but Abdufada uh, Jandali, 
uh, was his biological father. Um, his biological mother was a daughter of a mink farmer in rural Wisconsin. And John, he was the youngest of nine children, and he was actually in the US pursuing a doctoral degree in political science from the University of Wisconsin. Um, Steve, Steve's biological mom and, and dad um, were pregnant at age 23, and Joanne came from a Catholic family, and her father um, wanted nothing to do with a wife that, was, that conceived a child outside of wedlock. And so, let's see, Joanne traveled to San Francisco and was care, cared for for a doctor that brought in, um, brought in young mothers and quietly put Steve up for adoption. There, there were some, so what was happening was this really tricky timeline because from my understanding, um, Joanne, Joanne, she desperately wanted to keep the baby. Um, her father was not well. And so the thought was, if I can, if I can prolong this adoption as long as possible, there's a chance I might be able to, to, to hold on to the baby. Um, and ultimately the adoption that they had set up um, for this, this young couple, uh, college grads fell through and in came um, Paul and Clara. Now, Paul, he served in the Coast Guard. He was, he was not a college grad. Um, and I don't believe, I don't believe Clara was either. And that was, yes, sir. Can you talk about the year? Because it's interesting as Roe v. Wade is Oh, that is interesting. We'll, we'll have to touch back on that. We'll have dates up here in a moment. Um, so we've got, we've got a adoptive mother that's very insistent that this baby goes to a college graduate family. Um, and that almost broke apart this adoption. The adoption actually closed just a few days um, prior to her father passing away. Um, part of the stipulation for, um, for Steve's adoptive parents were that, be, um, where they were to set up a college fund for Steve, which will be interesting when we get to that, po that point, because Steve had very little interest in college. Um, let's see, several, several years later, um, the jobs also adopted an, an, another baby girl. Um, interesting a lot, enough, this is my perspective, interesting. She's really not talked about much in the biography. Um, Steve has noted making several comments of him and his sister, they were not close. Um, and that's the extent that he dove into it. Uh, Stephen Paul Jobs, born February 24th, 1955. Um, as I mentioned, stepsister, um, her name was Patty Jobs. Now, there's this is an information rich slide so bear with us bear with me as we kind of step through it um he, he he bounced around they had several different houses as steve was growing up this is one that really made that really imprinted on steve and typically when we're talking about a, a large entity a large company um the founder's home I don't know if it necessarily has a place in a conversation about it, um, but Steve spent a lot of time talking about the implications of this design style and how that transferred onto Apple. Um, the architect um, Eichler was known as a, a smart and cheap and good um, designer. This, this home had um, little things for the time like radiant flooring um, that was not cheap, but somehow Eichler was able to do it across. He was building from, let's see, I have it here. He was building these houses for 25 years. And so the thing that stood out to Steve was these job, these homes were uh, smart, cheap, and good. They were, they, they received a lot of, um, design cues from Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and let's see. Like I touched on earlier, because of that, so Steve at a young age was influenced by this home here on the right, and he wanted to take those principles 
um, to the mass market, not necessarily. He wasn't, he wasn't a five-year-old saying, I'm going to do a mass market product and I'm going to do it like this house. But I think those core concepts that he was able to pick out from a young age helped him apply it to a company um, that he, was, he would later um, found. Um, Steve spent his, his childhood, um, his father, he, he had nothing but love for his adoptive father. He spent a lot of time in the garage working with his father, but his father, he, again, he had a mechanical brain. He understood how things worked and Steve, he tried, but it was ultimately not fascinated by automobiles and um, replacing components. What his father would do is his father had various jobs, a lot of mechanical, um, mechanical jobs, but what he would do on the side is he would buy cars of good value, replace components and turn around and sell them. And what, what would happen is that money would go into that Steve Jobs college savings account. Um, let's see. So right away at this age, um, we're starting to get little glimpse into the, the, the type of child Steve Jobs was. Um, and, and perhaps this is just a different time that could be part of it as well. Um, but as a teenager, Steve Jobs was a part of uh, the Hewlett Packard, um, I think it was called, it was a camp where young kids would come in and they would have different engineers come and talk to these kids about projects. And the kids were encouraged to go do the projects themselves. And so as a, as a teenager, Steve not having access to some of the projects that he wanted to build, he got out the phone book and called uh, Bill Hewlett directly. Um, it's uh, apparently they had a 20 minute phone call because Steve was trying to build a frequency count counter, a product that HP did in fact build. Um, sure enough, Bill gave him the, the, the parts he needed for his frequency counter and a job. Um, and so as a teenager, Steve Jobs started getting dropped off at the HP factory to build, to work on the assembly line for the frequency counters, which is just incredible. Um, let's see. Another aspect of this that is kind of formative to where we're going with Steve Jobs is this, another job he had was working for Haltech Electronic Shop. Um, this is when he was a little bit older, um, but what that was is essentially just an um, electronics component shop. And what he did is he spent his, his hours working there, looking at all of the electronics that people would come in and buy, establishing a price for those. And then he would spend his weekend hunting for those parts and sell them back to the owner of the business. So even at a young age, similar to what he would do with his father, going to junkyards and finding components for cars, he was looking for where's the value in product and materials um, and turning those over for a profit. All right, there's another side to Steve that we start to see come out here when it comes to education. So he started at Monteloma, um, and what happened was, and this is my perspective that Steve was he, was, he was really influenced by the adoption process. He was, his parents were transparent about it the whole time. And I, and what happened was his mother spent a lot of time with him pre elementary, getting him prepared for school, which sounds harmless, but what happens is you have a first grader that already knows how to read. And school is very boring at that point when you already know how to do everything. Um, one of the early pranks that Steve pulled with another one of his grade school friends was they created posters that said, bring your pets to school day. And wouldn't you know, these little, little kids were successful. All of their classmates brought their cats and dogs and whatever other pets they might have. Um, and it was, from his recollection, chaos. Um, yeah, right. It helped shape the rest of his classmates. Um, he then went on to fourth grade. He went to imaging. I'm sorry, fourth grade. He had imaging Hill as a teacher. Um, the reason why this is important to realize is up until 
fourth grade, Steve was bored. He was spending his mental energy trying to come up with clever things to do, which he was successful at, um, but he was not stimulated by school. He was just that far ahead. He had a teacher named Imogene Hill. Um, he's quoted as saying, one of the saints in my life. And he, what she would do is she would give him work to do on the side. She saw him spinning his tires bored in school. So she kept giving him more and more things to do. Um, math all across the board, all of all of their different, different topics. Um, she first started bribing him with large lollipops and then into like um, creative um, kind of like kits that you can buy. And eventually he was just completely immersed in the challenge of trying to do um, this, this extracurricular work. That resulted into him testing at, at a sophomore level by the end of fourth grade, which it's good, but not when you have a little prankster on your hands. Um, he was sent home three times by the time he finished third grade, he was suspended. Um, the school then recommended that he skip two grades and jump all the way to six, which his parents declined, but they did allow him to go up one level. This, there are good things that are happening, but there are adverse side effects to what happens. Um, one of those things was he, he, being that he was jumping a grade, um, he, he became a little bit socially awkward and that resulted in lots of bullying. So he was, he was young for his grade. Um, he was smart and uh, it, it left him kind of in a predicament a bit. And that, that actually would, the social awkward component of Steve's, um, of Steve's personality um, will stayed with him until his junior and senior year of high school. Um, I thought this was really interesting to touch on too. So Steve, throughout the book, Steve is, is, is asked about religion. Um, and so he, he, had this, he had this moment as a pretty young child at the age of 13. He saw the cover of this magazine um, featuring starving children of the Biafra War. Um, up until that point, his parents had been taking him to a Lutheran church. They wanted him to grow up um, attending uh, some, some sort of church, though the parents, in fact, were not very religious. Um, but at the age of 13, Steve saw this magazine cover, and he actually brought it to his pastor. Um, and he asked if, uh, if God knew what was going on with these children um, the doctor, I'm sorry, the pastor answered, um, and he, he recalled what the, the pastor said, but it, it did not suffice for Steve. And so ultimately that was the end of Steve's walk, um, with, uh, in, inside of religion. Um, he, he talks about it throughout his life, different, different, different points of it. I've got a couple quotes here that I'll read, um, I, again, my intent on this is just to show the framework that Steve was working through at various points in his life. Um, he, he's quoted in saying, the juice goes out of Christianity when it goes too, ba too based on faith rather than living like Jesus or seeing the world as Jesus saw it. Um, and in the final quote he, he, he mentions regarding religion, um, not too far before he passed away, he said, I think different religions are different doors to the same house. Sometimes I think those ho that house exists, and sometimes I don't. It's the great mystery. And that, again, that was years, decades later. Um, all right. The rise. So here we go. Steve is introduced to a person that would actually control the direction of his life. Uh, in the beginning, I said the Apple was founded by a visionary and a genius. I was not referring to Steve as the genius. Steve Wozniak, uh, another Steve, he is one of the co-founders of Apple, and he is, in my opin opinion, truly brilliant. Now, Steve was, was great at marketing. He was great at developing products that the world would in fact want, 
but the engineering component of it, of it could not have been done without this, this, this individual. Um, Steve, the Steves quickly became friends. Wozniak, brilliant in his way. He was also a little prankster. And these two, they, they got into some, they got into some trouble. They had some creative pranks out there. Now they met, um, in 71, um, Steve Wozniak was actually five years older than Steve Jobs. Um, Steve Jobs, he, he was pretty insistent that they were at the same maturity level, um, but I digress. Um, there is an incident called that, I called it the infamous blue box. Now this was a device that allowed, that Steve, the Steve, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak made in order to trick and trick the phone systems into allowing them to make long distance calls. There is a, a certain frequency that if you hit that tone correctly, you can, you can trick the AT&T system into letting them make calls. And what they did is, now they were not the first ones, they didn't discover the frequency. Uh, another individual discovered the frequency and the capability of this, um, but they were the first ones to do it digitally. And the way they were able to do this was because of Steve Wozniak's brilliance. They they went on to to make um, over a hundred of these of these boxes and sell them, which it gets me nervous just thinking about. But um, they were successful in that. And the reason I bring this into our conversation is what they did is they saw an opportunity. Um, Wozniak as a project, something fun to do. Steve, cut, kind of a little bit more in the less engineering, more in could we do this? Could we make something and sell it um, perspective? And this, this was kind of a, kind of a direction, a, a direction forming um, little venture that they went on uh, that, that, was, that was successful to some degree. I also think it's really important to talk about Steve Wozniak, because when you're looking at both of these two people, they are, they're somewhat polarizing. I'm going to make some comments about Steve Wozniak, and they're not necessarily to imply the opposite on Steve Jobs, um, but they grew up with a different set of um, morals and expectations. Steve Wozniak, um, his father, his name was Jerry. He was a Caltech grad. He was the college quarterback um, he went on to work at, as a rocket scientist at Lockheed. And so as Steve Jobs was in the garage trying to assist his father with repairing cars, um, Steve Wozniak's father is truly, he has uh, baby Wozniak on his knee talking to him about electrons and protons and all of everything in between. So Steve Wozniak, he, he had an upbringing um, that led him down this path of just being a brilliant engineer. Um, he's quoted in saying, my dad believed in honesty, extreme honesty, and, and um, to the point where it was almost a fault. He would, he would be, I shouldn't say to a fault. He was, he was passionate about not hurting anyone's feelings. And so, as you can imagine, establishing a company, sometimes you have to make the best decision for the company. Now, the other component about Steve Wozniak's upbringing, um, let's see, Steve Wozniak, he would be, now I'll bring that up in a bit. Um, Apple Groom, yep, all right, so, so Steve, both Steve's, they are, they are passionate about two different things. And the result was they were a great team. Um, Steve Jobs, no, I'm sorry, Steve Wozniak's father, he had this opinion that engineering was the end all. He, that was as high as you ever want to climb in an organization. Uh, and so Steve Wozniak grew up hearing that. Once you make it to an engineer, that's where you want to stop. You don't want to climb the career ladder any higher. And this type of mentality proved to be very difficult once we get into the Apple founding years because Wozniak found a place at HP. 
he was comfortable. He had, he had, he had peaked transitioning and doing, um, starting a company that was nowhere on the radar. Uh, and that took a lot of effort for him to finally can be convinced that it was time to transition. Um, this isn't a, just a side story in regards to what I mean by these two having slightly different moral compasses. Um, Steve took a job at Atari. Steve Jobs took a job at Atari. He was, Steve Jobs, he, he was a visionary even at a young age, but he was not truly an engineer. He didn't go to school to be an engineer. He knew how things should work. And he got in a lot of trouble at Atari telling the engineers how to do their job without actually doing it. So he made a bet with his boss. He said, I can deliver a better product than what your guys are doing. His boss agreed as long as he worked at night. And what, he, what Steve did is he roped in Steve Wozniak to help him. And of course, Steve Wozniak, he created an incredible product for Atari. Um, but the interesting thing here is, I don't know the exact number, but Steve Jobs boss said, if you get this done, I'll give you X number of dollars. And Steve Jobs kept the majority and only gave Wozniak a small portion. That's, it's just a small example of Steve pushing people to do their best work. Um, but also Steve took all the credit. His boss didn't know he brought in Steve Wozniak could do it. And so it's, it's just an, an interesting little snippet into um, how, how Steve Jobs' mind was processing even at that time. Now, they were members of the Homebrew Club in San Francisco. Now, the Homebrew Club is what it was at this point in time were individuals passionate about electronics coming together and showing off what they are doing. At this time, technology, it was not closed. You, you were showing what you were doing and encouraging other people to do what you were doing for free. There wasn't, there wasn't a, a concept of, this is what I built, now to cough up, time to cough up the money. It was, it, was, it was everyone was sharing what they were doing. Also, it's interesting to keep in, uh, take note that Bill Gates was also a, a part of this club. Okay, Wozniak, now 26, um, brought his microcomputer design. So he, what he had done is he had designed a computer, uh, Wozniak had, while he was on the payroll at HP. Um, due to his moral obligation, he actually brought that to HP and said, this is what I've built. Is this, do you have interest in this or can I have 100% ownership in this. They looked at it and they just, they, they were not interested at that time. Um, he showed his friend Steve at that time, Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs, again, just a glimpse of what he was capable of. He saw a vision of what this device would become. Um, and so they, they teamed up, they went to the Jobs family garage where his father had set aside a portion of the garage for them to work. Um, they actually approached a, a small entity and showed them the product and were able to secure a contract before they officially went into business. Um, to, in order to fund that contract of providing these, these uh, first generation computers, Steve Jobs sold his VW bus and Wozniak sold his programmable calculator. I'm not going to say anything about that. I probably would have sold it pretty easily, but uh, um, all right. So Steve Jobs came up, they actually, they grinded on the name for a while and they actually got to the point where they just needed to put something on the paper. Steve Jobs, he in fact came up with the name. Um, Steve had developed a lot of things growing up. One of those was a constant, he was always doing different cleanses, dieting changes. Um, he had a neighbor that was a big influence on him about growing um, your own food. And so early on, Steve had kind of a transition into uh, what he should be consuming. 
he would go weeks just eating carrots. It was, he would, he, they were kind of, they're wildly, um, they're various uh, diets that he would do. And so he, he actually spent a lot of time going to an apple orchard and working. Um, and that's where it came to him. That maybe we should call this apple. Um, <laughs> it was also, from my opinion, it was also a placeholder. It wasn't, it wasn't, ah, this is what we've been looking for. It was, let's just throw apple down. And if we don't, if we don't come up with anything better, so be it. Um, Steve does note that he likes how it's fun spirited and not intimidating, which he is correct. Apple, it, it's approachable. Um, the first logo was a picture of Newton sitting under the tree with an apple about to fall on him, about to fall on his head. And there, there it is. That's the logo right there on the right. Um, the logo was actually hand drawn by Ronald Wayne. He is Ronald Wayne is the third founder of Apple. Um, how many of you knew about Ronald Wayne? Have any of you heard that name before? Okay, I've got a little bit more information on him here in a moment. It's a little bit heartbreaking. Um, on April 1st, 1976, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Ronald Wayne created Apple Computer Co. Um, January 3rd, 1977, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak incorporated Apple Computer Co. in Cupertino, California. Now you'll notice there were three partners up here and they were down to here. Ron, um, let's see, Ronald was, he was a part of it. He was crucial in getting Wozniak to join the company. Wozniak had known Steve long enough that he knew he had this ability to influence. The, the ability to bring in a third founding member allowed it not to be Steve versus Steve. So that was one of the components of it. Unfortunately, Ronald was only a member for 13 days. What happened was with this board you see here, that is what the, the technology shop purchased, okay? They bought this, um, this, this computer here. In order to complete or fulfill the contract, they needed to take a $15,000 loan. Ronald was concerned. And the reason I say that is he was the only member that had any collateral. At this time, he had a home um, and he was afraid that if they faulted on their, on their loan, he would in fact take the blow of it because he had something the bank could repossess. So he bowed out 13 days after founding Apple, at that time, Apple Computer Co. Any guesses on what his portion would be worth today? Anyone? It's not an easy number to swallow. I will say he did get paid $800 for his share. Unfortunately, today it would be worth $95 billion. <sighs> Yes, his, and, and to, I don't want to leave it on a sad point because he, at that time, businesses are founded every day. Not all of them go on to be a $2 trillion entity. And so I will say, I am impressed by his, his, at that time, wisdom. I mean, he, he had something tangible he could lose. And so, yes, he, he unfortunately lost out on a lot, a lot of money. Um, but he, I've read multiple interviews with him and he, to this day, he doesn't regret it because he could have lost a lot to him at that time. He lost a lot of money, but there was, there, there were times in Apple's history where um, it was very easy for Apple not to survive. Let's see, 1976. Initially, their first build, the Apple I, was just a working circuit board that could connect to a TV screen and a typewriter like a keyboard. So here's the Apple I. If any of you have one of these in your basement, let me know. I'd love to take a look at it. Um, let's see. They sold 200 units to that, that, that technology shop at a price of $666 each. Interesting price, yep. I don't wanna to dive too deep into it, but it did catch my eye. 
Um, due to their scarcity now, um, in 2014, one sold for a, a nice price of $905,000. Um, now this is what was built in the Jobs family garage. And this is also, um, it's, it's, it's a computer, yes. Um, you did need your own TV. You did need a keyboard and what you could do with it was incredibly limited. But again, part of the, the equation was Steve Jobs, the visionary. Um, and so from the moment he saw this device, I do believe he saw the potential of what it could turn into. 1977, they built a standalone machine in custom uh, plastic case. The other machines at the time were a steel box and they also had um, a color display in the Apple II. The image display was 280 by 192. Now, for those of you that have a, a high definition TV at home, this is nowhere near what that TV at home is doing. It is just a fraction. Um, it cost $1,300, which was too, too expensive for the general public and most businesses. Now, I, I probably don't need to reiterate this because all of you, you probably remember reading something about this, but PCs, personal computers, they were still, the, the, the actual industry was not there. And so trying to justify $1,300 on something like this, it didn't, there's there really no reason to. And plus, if you did, it wasn't the PC that you bring home today. You're, you're not able to just jump on the internet. Uh, there's no email. It was, it was still pretty limited. Yes, sir. I would characterize the environment at that point in time. I would characterize the, um, and the only reason I'm saying this because I was doing it. Um, I didn't have, uh, it was a hobbyist market. That's a great point. And so you built kits Mm -hmm. uh, Altair was one of the biggies. Mm -hmm. um, MSI, there were several different brands you could buy, but you had to have uh, elect or electronic skills. You had to build PC boards, uh, wire things, and so forth. But um, so that was the that yeah. was the clientele up until this happened. That's a great point. This was this was in theory one of the first plug and play. Uh, Apple IIe, I believe it's coming up now. I've got a graph of all of them. We'll see if we can track that down here when we get closer to the end. So 77, do you have a question? Are you okay? Oh, perfect. <laughs> sure. Might be a good time to add this because you were saying how you weren't alive, alive. for this whole time. <laughs> and, and I wasn't in an office where we spent $12,000 at that time to get a dedicated word processor. Wow. That's all it did. It was word processing. It right? didn't do anything. It was a yeah, Videk machine. Well, it was like. Was, uh, Wayne. was it Wayne? It was. I'll say in 1972, when I first started to work, uh, IBM came in with an automatic calculator that added, mm. subtracted, multiplied, and divide instantly without gears turning. And they sold it to us for $750. And we bought one immediately. It was too wonderful to pass by. That's amazing. <laughs> so 1978, just a few years after founding, Apple is starting to look like a company. They last right here, you see they sold six million Apple IIs. So they're 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 not in the garage anymore. They're out of the garage. They're now they're hiring real companies. Uh, Regis McKenna stayed with them for a very long time. Um, let's see, they they had Michael Markula, Mike Markula invest in the company, becomes the largest shareholder, member of the board. Uh, Wozniak invents a disk controller that enabled them to add a floppy disk drive to the machine. At this time, the Apple II is still their primary, uh, or I'm sorry, Apple II is still primarily used by amateur programmers. Now, 1978 to 1979, 
what this thing is capable of starts to take shape. Um, some of these and some of these apps might look familiar to you, but we have the killer app software program that is used, uh, useful at drives at drives hardware sales. We had busy calc, um, busy calc is credited with one fifth of all Apple II sales. Uh, so all of a sudden this machine that was truly intended for started out at least for hobbyists is starting to have some real world, um, implications that real world uses you can you can all of a sudden do this use this to to help small businesses or education markets now this 1980 um you kind of we're going public we they've they've made it like they are they're a, a real entity they've got a thousand employees now i saw this headline that i just could not not put in here Apple computer set to go public today, Massachusetts bars sale of stock too risky, um, which is just, it's uh, again, how far we've come, right? But they did hundred million net income. Um, Apple Apple has, the, has a public offering, which is the largest IPO since Ford went public in 1956. So despite Massachusetts not, not being allowed to buy the Apple stock, Still did okay. Um, let's see. In four years, they went from four years they went from a fifteen thousand dollar contract to a hundred million in net income. Um, that's I would say things are pointing up. So now we've got some challenges. One of them being IBM builds an IBM PC readily with readily available components rather than proprietary hardware. This is interesting because Apple today, as many of you know, it is still a company that, that likes to control all elements of their product. Now they're starting to get some market competition. And what you'll see is they don't step away from that. They still, they double down and hold on to um, control of, of, of the devices they're selling to an extent. We'll dive into that. Um, let's see. Yes. Just generally, that's referred to as a closed system. Perfect. Where IBM was an open system. Open system enables manufacturers to use the same hardware components um, as IBM to make devices that are compatible with the same software. Um, software developers, so you can make a, hard, a product. If you don't have developers excited about that product, your offering will be limited. So you need to, you need to release a device people are excited to work on. Um, software developers left for the IBM PC because there's far more opportunity there. Um, IBM gets its own killer app, the Lotus 123 spreadsheet, which becomes popular in business communities, which Apple had yet to penetrate. So they now have some competition. 1981, tough year. And we're starting to slip. 1983 entered the Lisa. Um, the Lisa and the Macintosh teams were working in parallel to one another. Now, I did not realize prior to reading the biography that this was actually, this was a competition. These two teams, they were, it was a, a little bit savage. I'm, I'm not going to be gentle about it to the point where they would, they would, they had flags that they would steal each other's flags. Like these two teams under one company, they were, you didn't want to cross sides. Uh, you cross each other. Um, and what would happen was Steve was actually running the Macintosh team. So he would actively, if there was an engineer that was really starting to impress him, he was either disgusted or impressed. And you just know it in between, he would poach engineers to bring them to Macintosh, which was interesting. Um, let's see. Efficient computer for all business. Lisa was the first Apple device that featured on screen windows, a mouse. Um, the use of icon pictures instead of, instead of protocols, this is known as graphical user interface. Um, Apple got a lot of backlash for using uh, the GUI interface as it was thought to be toy-like and unlikely that adults would have any interest in that kind of operating system. Now, this is, this is a... <laughs> 
this is an interesting little so there's there's a story about this that i want to touch on and that is what is happening at this point in time is there's another entity called xerox xerox is close by xerox is actually taking note of what apple is doing and they establish a little bit of a deal with apple and one of the caveats to that deal is the apple engineers get to go shopping they get to go to Xerox experimental portion where they're they're doing new things. One of the things they come across is the mouse. One of the things they come across is this graphical user interface. And so they see it, they talk to Xerox. Xerox says, this is very cool, right? But we're not gonna do anything with it. So Apple takes it. And Steve and, Steve and Bill Gates have, they have a love-hate relationship. They, they're best friends for some, some years, they're enemies in other years. Bill Gates has a famous quote where he says, you were claiming something that wasn't yours. Essentially, we both robbed our neighbor because what Microsoft did is they went to Xerox too. And so, and what they also did really well is Microsoft saw what Xerox was doing and beat Apple to market. They got to market very fast and that didn't help the Steve and Bill Gates dynamics. Yes. So I add one more piece to that mm -hmm. story. So um, what the uh, uh, Palo Alto Research Center Park, P-A-R-C, was mm -hmm. the research facility for Xerox. Mm -hmm. And that's where the graphical interface was, as you point out, was invented. That's also where the Ethernet uh, mm -hmm. communications technology was uh, invented. Yes. And there are many other things. And I've always said that the joke is, is that Xerox makes great copiers. Mm -hmm. They make great technology, but they never could get past being a copier company. Yeah. And uh, they made great computers, the Sigma series in the early 70s. Um, they did a lot of things. And Park, mm -hmm. and I've, I've been there because uh, I worked for Hewitt Packard back in the day. And, and it's an amazing place. And they created so many cool things but they could never get past. And so I don't know if that was a leadership issue yeah. or what, but uh, so many things came out of that research center. So that's fascinating. Thank you for telling me that. I did not know that ethernet came out of there too. Boy. Um, 1984 Macintosh was originally headed up by Jeff Raskin later managed by jobs. Cost was 2,500 one fourth the price of the Lisa. And it was initially targeted price um, for a thousand dollars. So you'll notice I brought a close. It's not quite the Macintosh, but it's. I, I take that back. It is a Macintosh. This is the Macintosh Plus, so a later iteration. Um, it was named Macintosh Apple, Raskin's favorite Apple. Um, now this is what brought us to the first. So what happened was Apple was trying to figure out how to hit mass market. Um, and so they, um, they, de they developed a Super Bowl commercial, which is probably one of the most famous Super Bowl commercials. Um, and it, it did, the board hated it to the point where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak pooled together their money to pay for it themselves. Um, let's see, Mac did not live up to the Apple's expectations due, due to insufficient memory and storage capabilities. Uh, it also did, didn't have a color display or cursor keys, which had become standard in the industry. And it was incompatible with the Apple II software, which compelled education institutions using the Apple II to hold on to their outdated models instead of taking. So the software that was created for the Apple II did not work. You had to buy a new copy, a new license. And so some of those large entities decided to hold off and wait for an option that did transition or transfer. Which software was invented by Apple? Which was, which software? All software? The, a lot of the the software that you would run on the Apple II, like some of those those apps that we we're talking about, did not the licensing did not work on this one, and so that you had to buy a new license, therefore upgrade, which Apple saw as an opportunity for revenue. You have to upgrade. Sound familiar? Um, and so that that ultimately held held them back on sales. I, of course, in 
it, it makes a lot of sense now looking back that it would have made sense for them to make it transition to a new machine. They would have gotten that sale um, or they would have, it, it makes sense looking back that there was an opportunity there, but I understand why they didn't do it because they would have had to have an engineering team dedicated to making sure everything that was designed for the Apple II works on the new machine. This is the Super Bowl commercial. I don't think I had it all queued up to load, but I don't think we can get it to load. Uh, let's see what happens. Yep, oh, we tried. All right. Let's see. Apple releases an affordable laser printer compatible with the Mac computer as well as the Mac's first killer app, PageMaker. Uh, this introduced Macintosh computer into the graphic arts and publishing in, uh, industries, enabling small business print shops to pr pr produce professional looking marketing materials without utilizing more expensive processes. So they, they actually break into this market and they, they dominate this market for a long time. I remember even when I was looking for a computer to go to school, it was if I was doing videos, photos, um, there was there was no option but Apple, and even back when I was in when I was at college, if you were to look around at that point in time, there really was not another computer in my classrooms other than Apple. It was just incredible. Let's see, yeah. Um, Nineteen eighty-five. The board is the board is trying to figure out how to get back the, in the right direction. What happens is Steve actually ends up. Um, spending a lot of time talking with this gentleman here, John Scully. At that time, John Scully was the CEO of Pepsi. Um, and Steve thought, saw him as a good fit for CEO. Now, it's important to keep in mind that Steve, he, he is aware of his shortcomings. He knows he cannot lead this company. He needs a CEO. He is also very manipulative. And so he needs the right candidate that he can, they can handle the stuff that he does not want to deal with, but he can also influence. And so Steve, he, he, he zeroes in on John Scully. And I tell you, he, he spent a lot of time trying to recruit John Scully to Apple. Um, and like it says in that second bullet, he didn't have any interest in the role uh, as CEO, which took, a, it, he did not want to take away, Steve Jobs did not want to step out of anything that would take him from the day-to-day -day operations. So what happens is Scully comes on, they start to, they start to bash heads a bit and Apple continues to really struggle. Um, the, the computer that he spearheaded is not doing well. And so things get bad. And I always understood this as Steve was fired. Steve was actually offered a different role, but it did take him out of that day-to-day -day operations. Um, the board essentially told Steve, go over here. Just stop making waves over here and let us try to get this right. And so what happened was Steve ultimately left. He, he resigned. And I did not realize that until recently. Um, earlier in that same year, Steve Wozniak also left to become a teacher. Um, there's a famous sugar water quote. I'd be, I'd be silly not to quote in the process that Steve was trying to recruit John Scully. He asked him um, if he was going to sell sugar the water the rest of his life or if he wanted to come change the world with him. So confident. Um, let's see. So under Jobs, the focus of Apple had been producing high quality machines at a consumer friendly price point. After Jobs left, the board decided and said, target the high-end market with more powerful, expensive Macs. 
Um, these machines continue to be um, to be of value due to their visual interface as opposed to the common text-based computer. Um, and the board was pushing for a 55% margin. Uh, yeah. We're kind of going through this period of time where Apple, it's continuing to lose market share and they're just trying to figure out how to get back. Um, they're, they're trying some radical things, including teaming up with IBM and Motorola. Uh, they joined forces and formed two new software companies, Taligent Inc. and Kalita Labs. Um, the goal of Taligent was to enable both the Mac OS and the IBM OS to run on a new computer hardware platform. The goal of Kalita Labs was to develop multimedia software. So they're just they're throwing money, trying to figure out a way to stay, to stay relevant. Um, I remember I was talking to my mom about this period in time, and she says she remembers distinctly she thought Apple had had gone bankrupt. It was that hard to find the machines. They were just they were they were doing everything they could to stay to to survive. Um, Apple and IBM couldn't seem to agree on some major engineering specs. Again, Apple likes to do things the way Apple likes to do things. Um, ultimately, things were dissolved apple pulled out out as costs were up to 400 million for intelligent and 200 million for Calida Calida labs one of the outcomes of this um aim alliance was the development of power C pc processor which would be the platform for apple's computers for for years to come 1993, Michael Spindler replaces John Scully, the CEO who previously, he didn't fire Steve, gave him an ultimatum. Um, Spin, Spindler successfully migrated the Mac OS to the PowerPC microprocessor, but, the, but Apple continued to struggle. Uh, they couldn't figure out market projections. They couldn't get their inventory right, ending with surpluses of some goods and billions and dollars, billions of dollars in back orders of others. They had quality control problems, including defective line of monitors and combustible PCs. Yeah, not great, not great. Um, Spindler ultimately is fired in 1996. And now the board thinks, okay, guys, we got to get creative here. <laughs> if only there's the perfect person. Um, so what happened in the meantime was Steve, he saw an opportunity in the educational market for PCs. Um, and so what he did was he actually founded a computer company called Next. An interesting component to Next is he was, Steve was, he was obsessive on design and he spent an absurd amount of money for the housing of the Next PC to be perfectly um, symmetrical. He wanted every corner to be perfect, which I'm not, um, I do not do any um, manufacturing, but from what I've read, perfect, per perfect for each device is very challenging. Um, and he, he, yeah, I'll leave that one off. Um, let's see, in early 1996, Gilbert Elf, F. Emilio took over as CEO. Apple cut operating costs and put in, put in place increased quality controls. Um, damage had already been done to Apple's reputation and only a small percentage of computer buyers were even considering a Mac at this point. To, tr to try to find a replacement for the Mac's old operating system, Apple purchased the Next Step software um, for $429 million and 1.5 million shares of Apple stock. Next step was formed by Steve Jobs as he had left in 1985. Jobs remained, in a, Jobs remained as an advisor to the CEO, but quickly lost interest and sold all of his shares but one. Um, Apple was still losing money in 97. Apple fired Emilio, which again, Steve Jobs was, he was a persistent individual. He came back. I think everyone would probably have different perspective on it. He came back. He did not want to come back and be quiet on the sideline. And so what he did was he, I'm not going to say a coup, but he was excited to step in 
as CEO. And I will also say, Steve, at this point, he, 10 years had gone by. He had gotten a little bit wiser. I think he was ready for to guide the company, but he was he was he still had some growing up to do. Um, so this is what happened in '97. Jobs immediately took over the revitalization of the company that him and Waz had built. Um, he teamed up with Microsoft. Microsoft at this point, '97 was was doing very well. They were um, a large player in the space. And so an alliance with Microsoft was a strategic alliance. They ended profit draining initiative to license out Mac OS. So the software that Apple was creating, they were running, they were trying to run on other machines. And when you don't have control of, of all elements, things can happen. Things won't work as they should. And so I think that was strategic. That was a good idea to end that. He streamlined product lines to focus on education, publishing, and consumer markets. He slimmed down the product line of computers to four, two for business, two for consumers. And what he quite literally did, he was a man for a whiteboard and a marker. He pulled together his team, drew a circle, and put some lines down. And he said, put devices in these categories. That's all we're going to do. Now, at this point in 97, Apple was selling servers, CD players, printers, cameras, game systems. So they were, they were spread thin. They were, they were doing a little bit of everything. And Steve's approach was, let's stop the bleeding. We can't be great. We can't be great at everything. Let's focus. Um, he, let's see. Of course. Time, um, Apple's great success was if you were in publishing, mm -hmm. uh, graphics art, graphic arts of any sort, um, and education. And so that's where there, all those other things you described, they weren't successful at. Mm -hmm. But if you were in the graphic, in I, in, I had a job at a particular time where I was responsible for a lot of uh, technology in large corporation. The only apples we had mm -hmm. were in the graphics department. Hmm. Graphics department, and so we had a publishing arm, and that was the only place Apple was. Everything else was Microsoft and IBM or, or PCs. If you yeah, will. that's so fascinating. That, that was that's what kept them alive. Hmm. So, ninety-eight introduced. Now I have this one a part of my collection, but again, I, I would have needed several carts to bring in all of my all my collections. So Apple brought out the iMac with a transparent back. It was radically different than anything that was currently on the market. You can, I don't know if those of you have seen it, but it is quite literally translucent. So you can see the components in back. One of the one of the characteristics that Steve Steve Jobs' father brought him up with was he had an obsession over the parts you couldn't see. the The front should should look as good as the back, and it makes sense to me that they finally went translucent, where they could show off how how good the interior and in, of a device that typically we wouldn't see, in fact, does look. Um, Apple had a prof profitable fiscal year in 1998 for the first time in three years. Um, Apple shifts away from proprietary hardware, allowing this computer to be more compatible at a lower price point. So they they loosened up on some of their values a little bit there to try to try to play ball. 2001. What was happening in 2001 was really interesting in in regards to. Um, the entertainment space. Well, what happened was we now have CDs. We have individuals having access to computers where they can actually, a friend can buy a CD. You can borrow it, take all of that music. Um, and so you have an industry that's losing money fast. Um, there's also, there are, are ways in which to get music where the artist is not getting paid. And so I was surprised to see 
Steve Jobs was actually approached. He did not come up with the solution. He was approached on how to come up with a solution to stop the bleeding for the entertainment, for the, for the um, audio, or for the um, production houses making all of the music. Um, so iTunes came first as a computer program for playing music and converting music to MP3 files. Now, it's important to, to note that that feature, it, it was a feature, it was exactly that, to take music and to copy it to your computer and have it a part of your library. So there were, it was, it was a feature, but there were implications on other industries as a result. Um, iPods were released later that year and quickly became the market leader for the MP3 player. Um, color, sizes, or features that came with iterations of the iPod. Um, fun fact, the term podcast originally or, or originated as a combination of the word iPod and broadcast. Uh, by 2006, more than 1 billion songs and videos had been sold through Apple. Now, our timeline is jumping a little bit faster here. And what happens is Apple, Apple is figuring out what they, what they need to do. And uh, things are working. The company is, is profitable and it's growing. Um, 2007 to 2009, introduction of the iPhone. Um, initially, the iPhone came out and was exclusive to AT&T. Um, iPhone release, the 3G iPhone release, which also included GPS and other features primarily geared towards business users. Um, the phone memory could be remotely wiped uh, if the unit was lost. It sold 1 million units in the first three days. 2008, the App Store was also introduced. Um, I, will, I will talk about this briefly. So at this time, uh, Personally, I am in school in Chicago. My cousin is actually doing, um, my cousin, a few years older than me, was he started a business doing iPhone apps because this was, this was new. Typically up into this point, your device came with whatever the manufacturer wanted on there. So now anyone that could code could create an app and put it on the app store. So my cousin, I started working for him um, and he had me playing with this one game. Again, there were, there were not many apps on the app store. So you could put anything out there and you could get a lot of traction. And so he had me playing with this one game, experimenting with it, seeing what I thought of it. And I could not notice that it was making the phone so warm. What is going on? At that time, it was also November. And I thought, boy, I wonder if we could do this in intentionally. So right before Christmas, we rolled out an app called Pocket Heat. And, and what it did was it turned your GPS, it ran up your processor, it got that, that device nice and toasty. And it did really well in the app store, specifically Japan. Japan loved the app. Um, unfortunately, Apple did not. Apple only let us have fun with it for about a month. And then they pulled it and said, we don't love that you're heating up our device, so we're not going to let you sell it anymore. So anyways, that was, if only, maybe another month that could have done it, but no, for whatever reason, Japan just, they loved it. That dollar app was worth it for, for them. Um, 2009, iPhone 3GS sells 1 million units uh, in three days. Um, Apple Apple's share of smartphone market reaches about 20%. Um, BlackBerry still maintained the majority of the market share at about 55%. The, uh, let's see, 2010, the iPad is introduced as an intermediate device between a laptop and a smartphone. Now, did any of you purchase the first generation of iPad? Yes. That, the first generation iPad, it was, it was, it was groundbreaking. It was so interesting. It was also a device that brought a lot of people to the emergency room. I didn't know this, but what happened was people were so thrilled that they could read in bed that they would fall asleep and get themselves. And it was a hefty device. So they would cut themselves. Um, so, so the iPad was brought out in 2010. Now, I do like to talk about the story that the iPad was actually invented before the iPhone. What happened was there was a high-level engineer at Microsoft 
for his, for his birthday, he wanted to have dinner with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And somehow this engineer, it happened. Um, so he was, he was sitting, all of their wives were with him and he would not stop talking to Steve about this project he was working on for Microsoft. It was a tablet and he was, he was thrilled. He was, he was trying to sell jobs on it for whatever reason and jobs, Steve jobs was getting so frustrated. And so what he ended up doing was he went back, pulled together the engineers and said, I'm going to show this guy how a tablet really should be done. Now, what the engineer there was insistent on was the stylus and Steve knew the moment you bring a stylus into the equation, you lose people. And so they started experimenting with touch, um, touch features or touch capabilities. And at that same point in time, there was a team working on a cell phone. So they brought that touch capability they made for the iPad to the phone first and put the iPad on pause for a few years. Let's see, the iCloud. iCloud was introduced, a computing service where users could store their applications, photos, documents, calendar, music, um, would automatically update your information uh, to users and other devices. Apple's uh, way to use, to move away from using a personal computer as a primary location for data storage. So iCloud, it did not land as immediate success. They they floundered for a little bit when they tried to bring in the cloud. Um, it was, it was, it's, we all now, when we hear the cloud, we picture this, 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 we're probably all a little bit confused because the cloud does so much at this point and we don't exactly know all the things it does. But when they first brought it out, it just had a few simple um, features. Now, again, if you go into your mobile device, if it's an iPhone or iPad, you can just scroll through all the things that are syncing to the cloud. And if you're curious on the cloud, we can get into that a different day because it is, it is dense. There's a lot to it. 2011, August 2011 specifically, Job resigns as CEO due to health concerns. Uh, Tim Cook, current CEO, COO, took over as CEO. When Tim Cook initially took over, Apple did not produce any new products, but rather release new versions of old products with new features. And I think this is a little bit foreshadowing. There is a quote in the book that it finally made sense to me how Apple has managed to stay in this position of um, relevant and maintaining market share. And Steve Jobs makes a quote where he says, if we do not create products that devour other products of ours, someone else will. And so it makes sense as you think about the iPod slowly being transitioned away by the iPhone, that is intentional. They need to continue innovating. And that was what, one of the brilliance of Steve Jobs. He was always able to deliver what the consumer needed prior to what the consumer knew what they needed. Um, and this is just a caveat. Now, of course, we've, there's, Tim Cook has been in control for quite some time now and new products have come along. But in my opinion, that is one of the areas that Apple is struggling is innovation. They do not have the innovative um, individual like Steve Jobs at the helm like they did prior. 2004, we're stepping back here briefly. Um, Steve Jobs was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Now, this was a rare form of pancreatic cancer. I read earlier that 1% of pancreatic cancer is the, is the type that Steve had. They also listed what it was, but I couldn't pronounce it, so I didn't put it in here. Forgive me. Um, his, ca his cancer continued to progress, resulting in uh, a need for a liver transplant in 2008. This is, this is pretty tragic because Steve, he was diagnosed with, with cancer that was treatable. He, high probability of success, we should say. He ultimately, when he was um, diagnosed, the doctor's recommendations were, you need to go into surgery as soon as possible. And Steve, he was a, 
he was a stubborn individual. Um, he, he's quoted in saying, I did not want my body to be opened. Um, I did not want, I did not want to be violated in that way. He believed that his body was a temple and he did not want it to be um, opened up. And so what, what ultimately happened is he postponed surgery nine months. And in that nine months, that cancer, it, it had implications on other organs unfortunately. Steve Jobs died October 7th, 2011 from the initial pancreatic cancer. Now in that time, he also did have a liver transplant in 2008. Um, he, he was on two lists um, and ultimately got the call when he was in a bad way. The fact that he survived his liver transplant was truly incredible. He died at the age of 56. Um, 2014, uh, Tim Cook is in control at this point in an attempt to, to bolster their entertainment space. They purchase Beats, um, for $3 billion. It's a consumer product, um, consumer product company that produces audio products. The goal was to produce high-end hardware that could reproduce studio quality music. And it also is Apple's largest acquisition to date. Now, Apple has iTunes, Apple has iPod, Apple has the iPhone at this point. Apple has this entertainment space and they're looking to add products to that. They're not necessarily in that point when Steve initially took over where they're cutting products. They're looking at what other markets can we get involved in. 2015, the Apple Watch uh, is a line of smartwatches designed, developed, and sold by Apple Inc. This device utilizes Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular technology to pass information. Since there have been several iterations, um, since its debut, as of 2020, there was believed to be 100 million active watches. Is one of them. There's another one. Um, another interesting product that Apple stepped into, uh, the AirPods. September 16th, uh, 2016, Apple released um, entry-level wireless headphones. The headphones consist of, uh, of speakers, a microphone, control button, and accelerometers. This, this product quickly became Apple's most popular accessory. Let's see, in 2018, Apple became the first company to reach $1 trillion, which a lot of money. Somehow in 2020, Apple became the first company to reach $2 trillion, which is even more money. Um, after years of developing their own silicon processors for their mobile device, Apple shifted to designing their own CPUs um, that has led to a dramatic capability shift in their products. And just to communicate that, so Apple, they were always very they focused that their engineers for the hardware would work in tandem with their software team. And that's one of the reasons when you pick up one of their devices, it works well. Both teams work together, making sure everything behaved. For their computers, one of the, one of the challenges is you have a company called Intel that makes a very good processor. Apple has mobile devices that they've been making their internal processors for quite some time. So as of recently, they've started making their own processors, meaning the Apple team has complete control of how that computer functions. It's, it's kind of a caveat to the whole story, but it's, it's really important to where Apple's at now. It's a, it's a dramatic shift. Now here is a timeline. This is a, so this is from founding to, I think it goes to 2018, all of the various Apple devices they, they have made. Um, some of my favorite were the, I don't know if any of you have worked on a dot matrix printer, but they are, I still do to this day and they are a challenge. So I'm glad they're out of that space. Um, let's see, we also have, do, does anyone see their first computer up here yet? Yeah, a couple of them. Apple IIe. This is one I'm after. I haven't found this one yet, but someday. 
Let's see, we are into 95 to 2008. You can see we've got some laptops. Um, let's see, there's the first iMac. We've got some iPods making their way into things. Let's see, headphones. This takes up to 2018. So 2018, I don't wanna, I'm, it's not definitive, but there are not a ton of new products to add to this. We haven't, we're, we're on the cusp of some new, new things. Um, bonus story, if I'm, I'm right, I'm a minute short of my time. So I'm gonna throw this in if that's all right. So this is a story. I just, it's, it's a fascinating story for me. So I hope you all will find it fascinating. This is um, a story in regards to uh, Steve and his biological father. Um, so Abdu Fada Jandali, Steve's biological father, previously a teacher, he had pivoted um, from teaching to a restaurant manager. Um, Steve's biological sister, Mona, Simpson um, began the search for their biological father, um, paying investigators to try to track him down. Eventually, she found one in California that was successful in tracking him down. Um, Steve did not have any interest in meeting um, John Dolly. And John Dolly actually left Steve's biological mother and his, his biological sister when she was five years old. So he had a he, had, he was not overly interested in spending time with him. Um, there's an interesting parallel here because Steve also, he had a daughter named Lisa that he also abandoned there for a period of time too. So there's just, there's a lot of layers to, to this story. Um, but Mona, Mona ultimately found John Dolly working at a restaurant in Sacramento. They spoke for a few hours. John Dolly at one point casually mentioned that Mona had an older brother and that will never see that baby again. Later in the conversation, Jindali reminiscing of some of the, the nice restaurants that he had managed in his career, including a Mediterranean restaurant north of San Jose. Um, this is a quote from John Dali. All of the successful technology people used to come in there, even Steve Jobs. Yeah, he used to come in, he was a sweet guy and a big tipper. Mona ultimately did not share with him that that was his son, but it's just incredible to me to see how small the world actually is. Questions, comments, concerns? Yes, sir. You mentioned that uh, you think there's some things on the cusp of uh, innovation and, mm. and products. And I heard on a business show last week, I think it was that there, um, working with things for the metaverse for mm -hmm. the next year. So I mean, sure. there's things like virtual reality heads mm -hmm. and stuff. And one thing they mentioned was that it probably would take a little longer to come up because of Apple's insistence that they get it totally right before yep. it comes out. Yep. So do you know anything about that or any other, other things that they're on, might oh, be developing? The rumor mills are running, running wild with what's coming. And you're right on, you're right on the money that Apple, Apple is fine. With the size of the entity they are, they're okay with not being the first. They are more focused on getting it right. Um, and right can be a moving target, in my opinion, for them because some of their products, it wasn't a home run right away, but they made a small tweak and it, it's a fantastic product. What we're gonna see, and I won't spend too much time on it, but we are as, as innovative as the app store was for the smartphone. We're on the cusp of that for what's called augmented reality. And that is where we're, our, our physical world is gonna blend with digital overlay. Um, a real world example of that would be if you were walking and you needed to stop in at a restaurant by looking at it, what will ultimately come is the restaurant, the name of it and the open hours, information such as that. Now, don't quote me on that, but there's gonna be some real world implementation or value add in this, in this type of software. So first we're gonna have a VR headset from, from Apple because Facebook, which is now Meta, is creating their virtual presence and uh, 
actively investing in it. So Apple's going to release a VR headset, but I think the, the long-term success that they're going to experience is a augmented reality headset that blends both worlds, the digital and the physical. Thanks. In your time in Apple, did you ever personally meet him or get to talk to him? No. So I actually, I did not have a glamorous job. I worked at Apple retail store. Um, and so as you can imagine, I, work, I, I worked on a lot of Apple products. And uh, and one other question, was he married and did he have a reasonably happy marriage? Yes, he was married. Now he was, I don't think I emphasize this, but he was a turkey. He was, he was, a, he was a challenge. Steve Jobs was he he had opinions about stuff so bless his wife's heart um, she put up I do believe she put up with a lot um, especially when he got sick he was um, he was not in a good way he he um, he did marry um, and had three children in addition to um, in Lisa as well so he he did have a pretty precious um, home life. I will say in addition to that, um, he, and what we didn't touch upon was when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, he was also, he had come across a company called Pixar that was built by George Lucas. And George Lucas was actually going through a divorce at the time and was cutting down, cutting some of his ownership and things. So he, he ultimately sold Pixar to Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs was actively CEO of Pixar and Apple. And he is also, he's quoted in saying that also contributed to his health issues because he was, they were not close together. So he was spending a lot of time going back and forth between both entities. So unfortunately, when it comes to running two very large companies, trying to fit family in there. I do think they paid a, a toll, a, a cost to that. Um, but he, yes, he was married and did have, did have a family. Any other questions? Yes. I don't know what, how much Steve Jobs was, would be involved with it, but these virtual Mm -hmm. eyeglasses now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just sitting there dumbfounded by my grandsons who go around doing all this stuff <laughs> in their headphone. Yeah. And you can't, you can't know what's going on in there, oh, what yeah. they're seeing that they're, yeah. and you put it on and you can't figure it out. <laughs> I mean, it's, I've, I, I am a, I'm a fast, I am fascinated by sci-fi so i do read a lot of books and there is um, there is a book that is a, a sci-fi book and it talks about the missing generation and i don't mean to send all of you out here concerned about what's to come because this is just speculation but i do believe uh, a world in which you can control your environment will be extremely lucrative to future generations and and so i I do, I, I, I'm optimistic that a hybrid where you can have the, or the, the digital and an overlay on top of the physical. Um, but even if you look at how far we've come in 20 years, right? Where before, when we left home, you were not accessible and I'll get, I'll call you back when I get home. And now it's, my wife can reach me whenever she wants. You know, and so even to this point, there has been a huge shift in how we interact and the next 20 years will be interesting to see what's to come. Well, I thank you all for coming today. Again, my name is Grant. I operate a small tech business here um, out of Holland and out of Grand Rapids. And so if you are ever in technological distress, please do give me a call. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the, the talk and all about Apple.